Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Jess. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Mandy, which came out in 2018 from director Panos Cosmatos. Jess, why don't you give us the synopsis? Mandy is a dark fantasy adventure story kind of set in a more contemporary setting of uh, the ni- 1983. Um, and you follow Mandy and Red through a dark descent into madness where un- vengeance and blood are shed and it uh, it's psychedelic, it's drug fueled you're never quite sure what's real and what's not, what's magical, what's just drug induced. It's vengeance and without going to greater detail, which we're now about to do, it's pretty awesome, so set back and prepare for a ride that's pretty psychedelic. <laughs> oh hell yeah. Now, th- when this film first came out, I kind of I kind of avoided it. Like there was a, a you know, there was a, a big fuss made about this film when it released. Like it was one of those films that that divided audiences. A lot of people were coming back saying it was the most awful experience they've <laughs> ever had and that they couldn't make it to the end of the film. And then there were those that were raving about it like it was the second coming. And I was like, and it's a Nicolas Cage movie. Yes. Now, you know, I, I like Nicolas the Cage movies. The chalk cheese of Nick Cage, we've said before, yes. some people just can't hack it. It's always when you have a director that knows that it's Nicolas Cage and knows how to work with Nicolas Cage. So much so that the director originally wanted Nicolas Cage to play the cult leader. And Nicolas Cage was like, no, 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 I want to play Red. And the director was like, you know what? I'm. I'm just not. I'm not casting you. I'm, and and they they all walked away from the experience. And uh, it was only later when Elijah Wood, whose production company was also the uh, uh, the producers for the film, a year later came back after having another chat with Nicolas Cage and with the director. And then after Nicolas Cage had been through some more experiences, he uh, the director felt that he was now more suitable to actually play the character of Red than he was a year or so ago. Yeah, the director is um. The son of a rather famous director. Yes. Um, his father was famous for directing Tombstone, which is a pretty fantastic film. And I believe he funded his first film off the royalties to that film. That oh, yeah. Well, this is uh, Panos's second movie which, after yeah. Beyond the Black Rainbow. Which, again, didn't do as well overall as this film did. Um, but it appears the man's on a trajectory of pretty awesome films. Oh, I hell mean, yes. So uh, the reviews for that were a bit more mixed. And again, it's... He's a man that makes very chalk cheese films, I think, because he's very high intensity filmmaking. And in that film, it was apparently very slow paced. In this film, it switches up. Because the first half, I can understand why when you said it gets mixed responses. If you don't get through the first half, which is a slow burn, it's kind of. But I think it's, it's just. It's setting everything up like ducks in a row and just the emotion, the it, care, the emotion between these two slightly damaged souls. Because you immediately get the feeling like cages on the edge of a worn life, like he refused that drink in the helicopter. Right at the beginning, right at the beginning, this is the very first kind of opening, he's on a hillside truck working as a um, woodcutter, chainsawing down trees, and then he gets helicoptered out, and one of his co-workers offers him a beer in the helicopter, and he reviews it, refuses, and you're kind of like, why? And I mean, it's like, it appears maybe he's a recovering alcoholic, there's a lot of subtle hints that he's a little damaged. Yes. Maybe a former soldier, because you kind of meet up with a character later that seems to be a former war buddy. Um, it, it feels like he's got a darker side to him. And Mandy's got a little scar down her face. She's a, be- a beautiful woman, but otherwise she's a little bit... What's the word? Rattled, like you get stories from her later on that kind of foreshadowed she had a rough childhood. And again, you've got these two slightly fragile people almost. It's the fact that they are living in almost complete isolation. Yes. And we find out they're living on Crystal Lake. Now, to be fair, that there's quite a few <laughs> Crystal Lakes in America, so it's it, it is, of course, if you're a horror fan, you know immediately that Jason Voorhees is just down the road. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it it it's the fact that they are, you know, they they, they do come across as damaged, and, and you know, from a like a generic kind of film audience watching these characters that talk to each other in really slow, elongated sentences, and, and it feels really human. It does feel human and believable, but it also feels very dreamy as well. Yes, like and... they're living a beautiful or haunting dream. Because she's an artist, and you kind of yes. have Cage, as he gets home from having done the first sequence where he's on, on the mountainside killing trees, you see her painting a picture. And again, it's these moments where he's just absorbing her art. And... Well, he's absolutely... if She is the centre of his universe. Yes. Uh, but it's like in scenes with them together, sometimes she is always central to the frame. Yes. And he is kind of like, I guess, you know, just to the side. Um, so it, it's like... 
she is the, the universe. She is the name of the title. She is the, the you know the center of his universe, and and the film, you know, is everything that, that is about Mandy is kind of bled into the uh, the the dreaminess and the visuals and the sounds of the film. The score's beautiful as well. Again, it's subtle. The whole soundtrack's got... They did a whole album for this, which isn't... It's designed to have been made in 1980s. And so it was written... And we'll get to the man who's technically the uh, author of that in the narrative. Um, but again, it's they've done so much sound work on this where they've got a fake album, but it's a movie. The album for the movie, along with this beautiful score. I mean, the, the unfortunately, the... Um, the composer passed away. Yeah, he passed yeah. away. Um, and he, the film is dedicated to him. Um, yes. Johan Johansson. Um, unfortunately passed away, obviously, um, just as the film was kind of wrapping up. But he did the score, thankfully, and so I think he's, it was his like last major yes, one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the film as a whole, the soundtrack's dreamy. Everything's great. And like you go through other sequences with them, because a lot of it's without sound. I mean, yes. they don't speak for them. There's one. not a lot of dialogue. No, and I think this is where Cage is an Oscar-winning actor. People don't give him the credit for this. I mean, he is really good at just emoting this kind of haunted, damaged man who's kind of just coping with life with this his perfect woman. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a lovely sequence. Um, you got like have them in a boat at one point, just drifting yeah it's oh, dreamy it's idyllic it's like it's... a painting but then it's got this 80s kind of grain to the shot yeah with the kind of crackle of a it, it should be said film. that the whole film was shot digitally but it does have the look of authentic film there was an intention to kind of give it that that kind yeah. of feel of a film of the 80s but now there was one of the things as well that um that i read that uh, panos likes to shine tiny led lights down the lens of the camera which gives the the frame this milky dreamy kind of visual look which you know and, and that's you know in almost in the entire film there's only a few shots where you where you see its absence and it's just that stark mundane reality like where you see mandy in, in the shop working and you know yes. and it just it just feels dull without that milky looking effect you do get a little bit of a, i think at the very end where it goes completely mayhem i think it's it's less of it but because the whole scene itself is like fire or mayhem but obviously yeah. uh why that is is obviously relative to the story um well the, the thing is there's there's not too i mean th this film is incredibly story light the plot is wafer thin and mm. and i don't think well, since... I, I, without being cruel without that isn't a criticism i think they leave you enough threads like i said there's subtlety woven with all the actions they take and all the choices they make that gives you an idea of who the people are but it leaves you as the viewer to draw your own conclusions oh, ab absolutely just like when they're having the conversation about wh what's their favorite planet and you know she's like my my favorite planet's jupiter and and explains why and then he says saturn but changes his mind to galactus of which course which is like oh wow okay a deep cut cut comic <laughs> reference and you're like oh okay and it and it shows the kind of quirkiness and it, yes. human again as i said i think it gives you the feel of who these two lonely but happy souls are <laughs> yes absolutely they're so content with each other like they don't need the rest of the world anymore and it's the rest of the world that invades in upon them um to a grave detriment of them both um, I, I should say that the film is broken down into three kind of major chapters and we start with the shadow mountains 1983 um and it, good and, year. <laughs> and, and it is the year that the film is also set in and the director has said that it was because 1983 had the best the best year of movies, or the most inspirational year of movies. One of which was made by his father, which yes. he said is his favourite, which is uh, of unknown origins. Right. Um, again, the man just... It's a wonderful kind of... Everything's a homage. And let's be clear, the 80s setting is magnificent i mean there's the clothing his car i yeah. love his van it's kind of he's got this off-road truck it's just black with the orange stripe and it looks fantastic every and again it's vivid and everything's vivid yes the bathroom which we'll get to in a bit vivid the um i think she's wearing a black sabbath t-shirt that jumps out at you again yes yeah. it's, it's all set perfectly for the era they're wandering through oh hell yeah yeah, it's just really good. But we one thing that is important to mention for the open is on top of the the um, album that was made up, Mandy's reading this novel called The Seeker of the Serpent's Eye, which is also not a real book. Yeah, it's just um, a prop. <laughs> it's a prop. Which again, I don't know how much of that book they wrote, but she's you see whole pages of not. She's reading it aloud, isn't yeah. she? Yeah, well, and narrating it. Yeah. And again, it gives you this, which we'll we'll get to as the film unfolds more. But this film has multiple layers of viewing. You can view it as the modern kind of. Uh, 
dark revenge story, which is clearly going to roll into. Um, but it also can be, you can almost shift the entire setting to a Conan era kind of dark fantasy swords and sorcery sequence. And every beat matches. I mean, everybody almost is an archetype from a dark D&D adventure. Um, <laughs> you've got the evil sorcerer, you've got the evil cult leader, you've got the uh, a hero, but in a dark, twisted adventure, he he kind of and it's vengeance, his you know, it's love, it's betrayal. Um, they also getting deeper into it later. It's just it's the choice of kill, shall we say, is classic. <laughs> Well, but let's yeah, uh, introduce the uh, the cult as they arrive. Well, that's the set, kind of moving into the second block because you get another beautiful because you get this um where we said before the Shadow Mountain nineteen eighty three. It's just like a graphic written by hand and yes, it's an artistic kind of drawing that unfolds and essentially then get children of the new dawn and roll across the screen which oh, it's just impactful and yes. again they switch between certain art styles in this you sometimes get other kind of as we said film styles switch during the film you get these art pieces that later on you get animation yeah it's just a film that's kind of a wonderful mix of filmmaking it just really is rich. oh it really is yeah um but yeah, the children of the new dawn are. Uh... It's play the the leader of the the cult is Jeremiah Sand, who's played brilliantly by Linus Roach, and he spots Mandy just walking along the roadside, and you kind of get like this triple take of her, yes. where where he's just completely infatuated with her, and then once he gets back and he's laying in his bunk and he he demands uh, that that she get brought to him immediately. As a very small side note, I will interject. He is Thomas Wayne from Batman Begins. Right, yes. He's the, Flash, he's the father of Batman. Yeah. Um, which I just thought was quite funny because I recognised him and I had to obviously look that up because I couldn't remember I'd seen him before. Um, but uh, Jeremiah Sand's character was like heavily inspired by Charles Manson oh, yeah. and his cult. When you hear, they talk about making the soundtrack, the guys who were making his... Because he's the one who actually... The, the fake uh, album... Uh, which you see in the film and when, yeah. he, when it's held up at one point, um, was made as if it was sung by him, and the guys creating it were just playing like ultimate narcissists and listening to like Manson's music and other yeah. music of other crazy well, hippie cults. Well, that's it. Just like Manson, Jeremiah Sand is a failed musician um, and a cult who, leader, <laughs> a cult leader who causes victims pigs, and they all take you know psychedelic drugs before acts of violence. Sex, violence, power. He's a super narcissist. and He's it's all, all about ego. He's yeah. all about himself. And, and that everybody kind of listens and hangs on his every word. Yes. I mean, his primary number two is essentially Brother Swan, Ned Dennehy. Um, again, great actors. A lot of these actors seem to be like stage actors. Um, a lot of English actors are all very good. Yeah. Um, and every, I mean, there's no weak links in this acting cast. So no. again, forgive us if we don't go into detail on all these actors. A lot of them are... They're all just so good, and he he's he plays this kind of simpering, the, the most loved of the cult followers because he always uh, Phil Swan must be yeah. reliable, and he he asked for the girl he saw on the road as they drove up, and uh, Swan's like, of course it will be done, yeah. no questions asked, um, and that just leads into the first of the truly surreal moments in the film, because <laughs> <sighs> he takes his ocarina. Oh, I'll add that at this point they're like, well, they might want another sacrifice, sir, and so it's a bit foreshadowing. Take the fat one. <laughs> Sweet in the this, deal. Yeah, they got this chuck ch one of the cult members is a bit of a big lad, and he's just like, and he's obviously hating the piggy because he's kind of uh, narcissistic and can't handle not being surrounded by beautiful people. Um, so he takes this ocarina known as the Horn of Abraxas, <laughs> right. carved from volcanic rock. Um, <laughs> it sounds like it's come straight out of D and D as well. I know this is where you start to kind of the blurring of what's going of reality, on. Reality, it's a fantasy. Kind of, I know, and this is it's just wonderful. So he drives to this kind of. Remote location in the woods. Yeah, and plays the beautiful notes yeah. <laughs> through this ocarina. And that is where we get introduced to, I would, uh, and many have also called the Cenobites. <laughs> yeah, because they're pushing the limits of what you can do to a human without supernatural play powers in play. <laughs> they're just uh, like a death metal biker gang. <laughs> yeah, they took the wrong sort of LSD because they pissed off 
their, their supply, which we can assume we meet a bit later in the film. Indeed, like, yeah. Because he's yeah. almost the wizard-like character. Yeah, they're, they're not supernatural creatures, but they, 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 they act like it. The film portrays them like it, especially when they get summoned. It's like, were they? where were they? How far away were they to hear this? Did they just come up out of the earth it when is, they were summoned? Yeah. It, it's awesome. And the way the, the lighting, because of the bikes and the yeah. demonic nature of them... Um, it's it's pretty amazing, um, and essentially they uh, they arrive, get paid in LSD. Yeah, which he guzzles down and oh, demands more. Drinks a gallon of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's bonkers. The whole oh, it's just beautifully shot. Again, it really is. I think that's where the the different lighting plays differently for those guys, and it's the whole kind of darkness where they're illuminating the shots. Oh yeah. So again, it's just it's it's pretty amazing. Um, and at that point, they all agree, essentially, clearly, to go and abduct Mandy. Because uh, they've located where she lives, because um, just prior to this, you get uh, you get Mother Marlene, which is another member of the cult, which you're only kind of introduced as you go on a little bit, to locate Mandy. And she works in a convenience store. And as we said, it's her kind of other... Clearly, her main job, while she stays at home and does a lot of art and uh, creative stuff. Um, so Mother Marlene locates where she is. And then they all, the biker gang plus the cult, arrive... And uh, they seize her. Seize her. They capture her, and they drug her. They drop these. Uh, they drop, I guess, LSD in her eyes, and then stab her with a. And then uh, this giant, giant bug, yeah, right? That giant they fish wasp. out. Oh, gross. <laughs> Sets the cherry on top. Yeah. So they drug her to <laughs> sin, and at this time you realise Nick Cage's red character is barbed wire bound yeah. and out in the garden, and uh, oh, at this point the buck gang vanish. Along with this beautiful shot of them dragging the the uh, larger cult member into the shadows. Indeed, indeed. You never see him again. <laughs> so it, it's just beautiful horror shots at this point, and, and it's beginning to now. Because before I say up to now, this is why some people might find it chalk and cheese. Because the first half of the film is so slow and well. Th- this next dreamy. sequence really is as well, and I, I know a lot. Maybe it's the first third of the film. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people would tune out during this moment where it's where it's Jeremiah Sands just. It's just him speaking for like 10, 15 minutes, just, you know, glorifying his own music, his own beliefs, the way things are. Yes. You know, he strips down full frontal nudity. Yes. Right in front of to Mandy. To seduce her. And to like... seduce her. But she just bursts out laughing at him. Like, she's, like, even despite being completely intoxicated with these drugs, like, she still finds this whole thing absolutely hilarious. And that offends him so much that he 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 puts her in a bag and takes her uh, with red who's been tied up in barbed wire hangs her upside down or actually you can't really tell she just hangs no. her in this bag from a tree one cult member's holding a rope just to maintain the bag above the fire throws gasoline all yeah. over it and literally starts a fire it's it's brutal and it's it's, it's all because he spoke to god in a mirror and yes. again, he's tripping on LSD, and they're just—it's oh, just psychotic. The whole thing is just psychotic. It's so brutal as well, though. Just like I mean, Nick Cage sells it. His reaction, his expression, his pain, his grief, his anger, his confusion. Cage is so good, and this is why people, anyone criticizing him, the first half of this film is Cage just kicking ass. This is a fantastic performance. I mean, honestly, this is why he earned an Oscar because he just emotes so much. Subtly, where people are like, oh, Cage was over the top. He goes over the top pretty yeah. soon, but well, almost it's, immediately it's because now, yeah. that's reasonable enough. Yeah, I mean, Sam's demonstrated himself to be this narcissist where he's talking to Mandy for that long period of time. Yeah, yeah. But it's setting up the fact, it's showing you who he is and how broken that man is because he's just he's vain. His music didn't do very well. He's angry at everybody. Yeah, and his fury just boils over when she just laughs at him like yeah, everybody yeah. else clearly has by his close knit cult and he's screaming at them don't look at me um, <laughs> it's, it's just the psychosis that leads to Mandy's burning to ash yeah. is just well, brutal it really is brutal and it's so tragic as well like the following like day the, the next morning he finally wriggles free he wriggles free of his barbed wire and he goes over and the ashes are just blowing in the wind you and you see just her, see the oh. outline of her skull and he goes closer to it and it just crumbles and breaks away and you're just like that is horrific like you know the the like you keep it's impossible almost to imagine the state of mind that he's in unless you've suffered something quite to that extent. Yeah, yeah. And that was something that, that Panos said, what this film represents or what it was about. And he said it was about the loss of his parents. 
at a really, at a, you know, at a young age and how that's impacted him. And those feelings is what's gone into this film. Yeah. And it and it and it's the next scene that, that follows that, that barbarity and, and that horribleness when he goes back into his house and the TV is playing and there's a commercial for the Cheddar Goblin. <laughs> Which is it's a it's a funny commercial where you've got this cheddar cheese <laughs> and this goblin pouring this you know th- this cheese over these kids macaroni, that are screaming, yeah, it's this like, macaroni it's yeah it's like and, and, and and it's and it's the fact that it, it what it's saying is that you know like these horrible things happen to people but the world carries on uncaring exactly and, yeah and, and, and yeah and, and, and red is just watching this commercial after just experiencing everything he just did feeling everything he did and this is the world that he's that you know this is the way the world shows its appreciation or yeah. its understanding it, or its it, sympathy it, it, it doesn't care it, what the clock keeps ticking you know, it doesn't matter what horrors have happened to you in the moment and he then just collapses yeah exhausted into his i think it's bed and then he eventually wakes up quite suddenly because obviously he cuts straight to him waking up and cage he starts to snap. The because... breakdown occurs. He grabs that bottle of vodka. Yeah. In a pair, his underwear and a t-shirt, he staggers into the bathroom and kind of gets it from a hidden location, which again, like, maybe he is a recovering alcoholic. This is all these subtle hints that this man is struggling with demons that maybe Mandy was helping him contain because she was, to some extent, his angel. Yes. Because she may have suffered some damage and, like, in the first oh, half... I think they're both damaged She talks originally. about her father killing, like, baby birds in front of her and that's obviously the first half of the film third of the film first third of the film because it's more yeah. like cut into three parts by the three titles the three titles yeah, yeah. Um, and so he starts to just clean his wounds with the vodka drinking half the bottle in the process going absolutely Balearic it's it's, it's the stark kind of wide angle shot of him in the bathroom oh it's a vivid you, bathroom you get the this entire is, yeah. bathroom shot and uh, I, I love the fact that as, as the breakdown is occurring the camera moves in and then when he starts screaming, the camera zooms back out again. It's like, don't want to get too close. Like, give him the space. Yeah. And then when he calms yeah. down, it moves back in. But then it snaps back out again. you get an emotional... Him just struggling with emotions and then it's exploding. Yeah. And it's this vivid bathroom. Very, again, 80s. Very vehicle, 80s. <laughs> greens and yellows everywhere. It's it's, it, it's almost ugly to look at. <laughs> it is. And that, that's, that's the design but of the time. It's it just is. perfect. But it, it also, I mean, it encompasses how he's feeling as well. Now, one of the things that uh, Nick Cage said, what what helped drive his performance for for the character of Red was that his marriage of 14 years had just come to a shocking and sudden unexpected end. Um, and so he was confused and upset. And so all of those feelings, you know, went straight into this character as well. And so it does feel like the feelings, the emotions and his portrayal has come from a very real place, which works after the brutality of the scene that, that came before it. Uh, ah, 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 ah! Yeah, I mean, actors do need fuel, and I think in this case, Cage is on fire. Yes. I mean, he's just fantastic. And I mean, it, it, the simmering moments where he's just bubbling. It, it, I mean, it, it's, it's sometimes I can, I can understand that it can be hard not to laugh at a Nicolas Cage over the top performance. This isn't the set that, though. I feel that bathroom sequence is magnificent. Yes, I, I agree. I really do. Yeah, because I agree with you. I think sometimes he does just let loose. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, do you X, Y, Z? Huh? That's all you have to do! But yeah, that, that bathroom sequence is haunting, because obviously that sets in motion the kind of downward spiral of his kind of well-being. Yeah. Um, until he get its closure, you know, the ending we, we can discuss. We'll, we'll get there, because now the, the film is... You know, it's a revenge story. You know, like Mandy yep. has been killed, and he's now going to seek revenge. And one of the first things he does is forge himself a weapon. But for, well, he goes to see the we- armor, should we say, in a mis- mystical sense, played by Bill Duke. Yes. Who returns to him his weapon, which is fortuitously named the Reaper, which is a crossbow. Yes. And Bill Duke's apparently forged two some new arrows for him, which can which cut are... through bone. Oh, yeah. I mean, so you <laughs> like a this... fat kid fruit cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill Duke's awesome because Bill Duke is awesome. He doesn't do enough films. He does a lot of production no. work. I mean, he—I think he's making a, re- a regular appearance on um, 
Black Lightning. Right. Um, the American, kind of the superhero. He's TV such a show. strong presence, so intimidating. <sighs> He's got the gravel. I think it's yes. the gravel and the gravitas. It, it's his stare, that that deathly stare he gives. And he wait, where like... he said he starts, and then obviously you get Cage trying his character Red trying to go whoa, 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 this and this and this happened. It's like oh well, I'm, I might know what happened. And it, it's just like, and he then starts to lay forth the quest, shall we say. Yeah. Just He's like, also got a box of um, of Cheddar Goblin in the background yes. as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just awesome. And I guess at that point they make the weapon on uh, near where, where yeah. uh, his, Bill Duke's kind of base of operations It's a beautiful is. silver axe, <laughs> which was actually uh, in the design of uh, Celtic Frost's uh, logo, which is a, a metal band. Yeah. Um, and so it's just another homage to, I don't know, eighties metal and rock. <laughs> yeah, and he refers to him as Crothers, which makes me think again a military man cause could be. Yeah. His surname. But um, so Crothers, which is played by the character Bill Drake's playing, kind of sets in motion, kind of foreshadowing. You're not going to come back from this. You're like, it's likely death if you go after this biker gang. And it's just like I don't know where the cults are, but I know where the biker gang are. So the kind of he's then on his kind of rampage fueled attempt to kill this biker gang and find yeah. out the location of the cult. And there he wanders off into the night and you see him with his bow and uh, he takes out like the straggler in the biker gang when he finally tracks them down Yeah, and uh, goes after them trying to run them over with his truck. <laughs> his truck. At this point, the only non-kind of medieval-like weapon is used and it looks like a flare gun sort of grenade. I don't know what it is. It's a big explosive pistol that flips his car um, and he is unfortunately captured at that point instead and is uh, taken hostage by the biker gang, which he was trying to slay, which is a nice bit of subversion. Again, it, it keeps yeah, you on yeah. your toes. And they obviously just, they don't emote. They've got masks on. It's almost like liquid pouring. They're demonic in they a way, are. yeah. I mean, you're not sure what the liquid pouring down the kind of lead guy who they first meet, <laughs> he first encounters close up. And he's just having a breakdown because he's chained to a pipe. And they nail his hand to the floor, other That's hand to right. the floor. It's like fuck. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's 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 grisly and gruesome. I mean, if you for the gore fiends out there, oh, enjoy yeah. this. The second half of this film just cycles. The first half slow going, but the second half just spirals into blood and gore. It's and anarchy. <laughs> Where he twists that pipe free and smacks him down and murders the first one. Murders the first one. He gets one. free, obviously, and rampages yeah. through this building. Ripping and tearing and snaps a guy's <laughs> neck. And... Well, he, he he grabs that broken bottle uh, of cocaine and yes. snorts it. He breaks that guy's neck, but then he also finds that the jar of LSD and he's the just... bad batch that had been foreshadowed. Yes. He he dips his finger into it and he's just like. <laughs> Like, like <laughs> this film, you can like read it on multiple layers, and just watching his skeleton, all of his skin fall off, it's like that is the end of that character of Red as we know him. Like he's undergoing a psychological and physiolo physiological change. Well, it does it does give the idea that it's like imbuing superpowers to him to some extent, because he's taking the kind of poisoned chalice to kind of empower himself it's a in order to fight those that are also consuming this drug <laughs> yeah well the, the, well that bad batch was apparently only meant for the bike because again it's foreshadowed that they screwed with a chemist which yeah. we do meet one soon after it's going this, to meet very soon now um who may well have been the one that made it it's not again not all of it's linked up but the mysticism of it makes you feel like they this was you know he's only taken a small amount and even that's kind of changed him yes. while they were totally lost in it he might i still i don't think he's irredeemable i think the ending is left open ended but it is a man who's lost his mind to some extent I feel oh, I, I think he, you know he is already in, he is broken you cannot break the character of Red anymore he is <laughs> beyond he's shot through yeah, the bottom no, of the I barrel don't think he ha I, I disagree but we'll get to that in a minute um, he is he, he he's is, still morally a better person than most of the cast the only way the only uh, defence I can give to that is the fact that he does let the other girl of yes. the cult go that, that's where I feel after and, he just randomly throws the axe and just kills the other guy yeah because after the sequence with the biker gang murder he goes actually outside and kills the last biker gang who he fires a bow uh, one of his arrows through, through the guy's throat and just pulls it out <laughs> you're like okay these guys are ridiculous yeah and then he goes in a, straight in with his battle axe and murders him eventually and beheads yeah. him um and it, that's what it takes to stop him because the guy's ridiculous um and at that point you then finally get him trace his way to 
the chemist, the yeah. wizard of the piece. As Indeed. I feel. Again, all of these people have kind of archetypes, and you're like, oh, it's, it's just like a what fantasy novel just reimagined. And again, it's revenge, and it's beautifully shot, and it's mystical because this is the most interesting scene between him and Red. Red doesn't speak. Right. Cage doesn't say anything, and they have a conversation as if he is speaking, but the the should we say the the wizard the sort of the uh, chemist is just reading me oh they wronged you man they wronged you I didn't I, I didn't know um you, yeah and then he's then he gives away where the it's like you want to go north yeah it's not even the directions it's just like <laughs> you need to go north the darkness is in the north it's just like what's the um and again it's like there's a tiger that he releases because red told him to red said nothing um <laughs> that's a, and it's just wonderful it's this tiger that goes outside and becomes as, you, as the scene finishes, it cuts to a kind of almost semi-artwork version oh, like roaring at the yeah. moon. And you're like, this it's is... beautiful to look at, but you're like, but what does it mean? It's all art like Mandy's been drawing. So again, it's all dealing with the kind of overlay of how much of this is in Red's head, or is it all real? Who knows? LSD's taking you to the real world. Again, this is the concept that the... The, the drug arg- the famous myth that there's a world beneath the world yeah. we live in and the drugs let you see it, man. Um, <laughs> and he is, and he's sinking further and further away from reality. Yeah. Uh, the more drugs and alcohol he takes and the more... Into Mandy's more art he... and music. and Yes. It, it's, she's still there. That's the thing about this film is Mandy's... Despite her dying a third of the way into the film, she haunts the entire movie. And you can read it in like three different ways. I mean, the oh, whole yeah. film is pretty spiritual dealing with kind of love and loss and uh, madness um because at that point anyway he from the directions go north um <laughs> from our sorceress friend he finds the cult's church yeah. that's being built in a quarry by the looks of right it. he caltrops a car and then yeah. he gets out and oh just yeah i was going to say with the with the other brother <laughs> he just kind of you know he holds the end of the axe in his mouth and then just drives it all the yeah. way through. So Swan he's just is the gurgling number, blood. Yeah. Swan's defiant to the end, though. He's fearless. Yeah. That's the thing. He's the he, being the number two. He's just fearless as his brains are crushed. He lets Sister Lucy go. Yeah. And that's where I still think, although he's lost it to some degree, he is a good. He's still there, and I still that's where I always have that glimmer of hope. Still, is that he may have lost his path, but he's not lost himself. Well, we didn't really see that other girl do anything villainous throughout the film. When no, she no, was a she, part of the well, cult. Well, when he's but... when he's tied up right at the begin, uh, with the barbed wire, remember our, our beloved cult leader makes her play Russian roulette. Yes, point yeah, blank yeah. up to his face, which to show how much she loves him. Yeah, uh, she's how much she's committed to, to and him she's and the just cult. Te- she looks haunted and terrified. Yeah, and, and she's, she's another victim of the cult. Yeah, yeah. she she knows she's. She can't escape. She's terrified yeah. of them. It's a lot of the fam- famous issues with the kind of the cult systems where people oh, for sure. just live in fear of them because they think they'll always be found. But then we get into a chainsaw duel. <laughs> we knew this being a horror movie and we knew from the first sequence where he has a chainsaw and he's cutting down a tree that a chainsaw would come back into the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and we see him pick up the chainsaw and he's having trouble getting it started. And one of the other cult members grabs a chainsaw and we just see it as he's pulling it along, and you just realise the length of this blade. <laughs> it's just, and it is, it's just a wonderful, uh, but obviously Cage is a specialist with this chainsaw, he's been practicing for years, so he beats the other guy and hacks him, and then eventually he, he uses loses chain. his chainsaw and makes him fall onto his own his chainsaw. Own and yeah. you get this sequence where he's flailing <laughs> and blood spraying out in front of him. Oh, it's just, it's just a wonderful, gruesome death. It's, it, uh, is. it is, it is. <laughs> It's just madness. Um, <laughs> by now, he's murdered what three? The three main kind of male yeah. cult collaborators, and then he runs into uh, the mother. Yeah. As he because he enters the church and realizes stairs down into what we'd assume is tunnels below the quarry. Yeah. And um, then he encounters her, and she again is just she's trying creepy. to seduce him, trying to play with him, trying to psych him out. The cro- it's a kind of the cr- playing the role of the crone in like the classic. Yes. Yeah. Of, archetype villain of you know she's and you think you're not sure what happens it cuts away completely yeah and but then, then you, we see her severed head get roll thrown room, yeah in roll it. into the final room yeah where our villain of the piece is uh tripping balls and communing with god of course of course um, <laughs> and he tries to explain that you know like he is god and that uh that red should just give up and, and bow down to him 
Just but like, it, it, yeah. it's you know he's just his own ego. And then he then Red grabs him and holds him. It's like, and then he suddenly flicks between like the realism. which like, I'll suck your dick, man. Oh, suck your dick. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you want? And just like, and then he suddenly defines it again. It's like, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. his, his narcissism is ch- chaining him to his own damnation. And just like, I am, I am. Uh, the voice of God, your bad enemy. It's like, no, I'm your God. <laughs> and uh, it's just like, and uh, then he crushes his skull. Yes. Which until again, his eye bursts that out. super drug must be super because he just pops his skull <laughs> and drops him to the floor <laughs> and burns everything to the ground. Exactly. I mean, again, it's almost symbolic as, as Red is walking away from this church that's burning. It's like, it's. For me, I read it as it's the end of Red's spirituality because you've got the big cross in the background as everything's just burning behind him. Again, I disagree a little. I th- I, again, it's, it's the end of his humanity. Like, there's there's no humanity left in Red no, at this point. No, he still is there. He's got man. Yeah, but it, 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 it's so messed up, though. It's yeah, well, like, he, he drives around the one of the cult cars that's so, left. He is so stricken with grief and despair and anguish, like, that the centre of his universe is gone. Uh, and, you know, out of this world, especially with the piece. fact... Especially with the fact that the entire landscape has become this alien landscape with multiple planets in the skyline. These twisted fantasy mountains. I'm like, he doesn't exist in our reality anymore. No, no, he's I so agree. far gone. He, he's lost. And, but... and, and, you know, and the film for me suggests like there is no, there is no coming back from that. I, describe, I think there's a spiritual kind of a peace with that. Because, he, yes, he's hallucinating Mandy's beside him. That's a bit weird. But... He isn't lost her. She's still with him. And he's sort of in killing and avenging her. He finds that piece where she's with him again. But his facial expression when he turns and looks and he has that that psychotic grin (laughs) before heading down the road into the credits. I'm like, that doesn't look like a normal sane person. I'm not saying he's sane, but there's a difference (laughs) between spiritual... I think he hasn't lost himself. I think he avenged her and found peace in that, but the price he had to pay is probably his sanity i mean there is a difference between like i said there's a difference between being absolute crazy insane like the bikers yeah. and being at peace with his kind of ruined life and i think he's lost in a fantasy which is fine and i don't think it's as tragic as you're making out but it's still a tragedy i think he's he's not become the devil to defeat the devil he just he let the girl go. He wouldn't harm innocence. He's still got his compass. He's just not seeing the world as he... Well, maybe he's seeing the world as it is. <laughs> maybe. See, see, now that he's peeled back the veil of truth. I mean, that's that's the that's the mystique. That's the intellectual meat and potato of this film, where you're kind yeah. of left going, I don't know what's going on. Well, you interpret it as you feel. Like, For sure. You're not wrong. I'm not wrong. Neither oh, yeah. There's right. many ways of reading the film. There really are. It is such a good film. I mean... Oh, it's just so many good bits. So I well, think Jess, what were your favourite parts of the film? From little bits like whether in the boat floating on the still lake, clearly just being happy, and it's it doesn't again, it doesn't fill you in with who they are or backstory. You don't need that. You just get a feeling from the shot. You kind of just get a, um, ambient information. Um, it's just a really beautiful film in every shot, even when it becomes a horror film at the end, true horror film. Um, everything's shot with such majesty it's hard to pick out scenes because every scene's beautiful like I love the where you get the tiger against the kind of night sky roaring and it's just like there's these sequences what we didn't mention is when he's going insane there's two animated sequences that are suddenly like oh it's Mandy and suddenly it's a screaming Mandy with demonic eyes or blood pouring in her face and I agree there is a kind of madness that is indicated through those and again this film just switches between art styles and a film style making styles and it's all seamless the whole film maybe the scores tying it together it just works everything's working magnificently the love and the craft that went into this is beyond words so um the best death sequences i think it's probably where he's killing the first cult- cultist brother swan with the axe yeah because it's just swan's defiance of fearlessness where he's just killed slams the kind of spike on his axe through the guy's skull and blood's just pouring down his face oh it's just brutal it is it is yeah i i have many favorite scenes from the film as well um first i'm going to bring up the cenobites as a massive clive barker fan hellraiser fan uh they are the the best looking cenobites i've seen in 20 years (laughs) i know and it's messed up again i think i think the problem with a lot of the horror films they decide to show you too much the cenobites are always shot in these dark 
yeah, dim crazy, lighting. All the cra- it's crazy lighting. When you see their masks or their faces or their armor or their, you know, the attachments that they have, it just feels otherworldly. They feel like demons. Yeah, like the goo rolling down, down one his of face. Them's face. Yeah, it's like, like, like is the, what, what's wrong with you? Yeah, they're just messed up. It's so cool. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the silver axe that he creates was awesome. So metal. So metal. So metal. Uh, the, the bathroom breakdown was brilliant. I love the camera work. I love the framing. I love the performance. I love the set. Uh, that that just really really worked. Yeah, every sequence. Though. I mean, that's the. This is where I'm gonna say it's like I could go on for the length of the film. Yeah. Give it a director's commentary of love the scene, love the scene, love yeah. the scene. It's just hard <laughs> to pick them out because now you're saying like even the Bill Duke scene. I mean, that's yeah. just so subtle and Cage is stuttering. Not again. It's there's certain ways of writing characters. It's it's an interesting study in how people are written you get it in different films like um tarantino's dialogue is not natural but it's supernatural dialogue, it's hypernatural yeah. hypernatural so you kind of get them delivering monologues and everyone waiting and not over speaking or stuttering or being confused by a brain pausing kind of brain flow like a thousand times i've had during this uh, review because <laughs> my brain will stutter and i won't deliver a perfect kind of monologue of what i was trying to say but they perfect in those films but other films where you kind of look at um fincher films maybe i'm trying to think he's a realist director i've just my brain went blank a good example of it. I know I was reading about this the other day and I'm pissed I can't remember. But yeah, I'll, I'll just cut anyway. But then there's more real dialogue, which I think this film demonstrates. That's a better example. Um, this film is really good because it's kind of giving these human conversations which are believable. Yes. In the first, well, in the more in the first half. And even the second half, no, no, because where he's having the breakdown where Cage is holding our cult leader and about to kill him, he's just rambling his his thought processes are broken his dialogue is believable as a man who's pleading for his life but also having internal conflicts about how to best express what he's feeling yeah and again this film just does it with such natural storytelling it's just so it feels so real and the conversation between him and mandy early on they're, they're just slow and pausing and a little bit broken at it's times. It's relaxed. Yeah, there's a relaxed It's human. comfortable. It's real. Yeah. It's it's the conversations you have between friends and yeah. loved ones. And I mean, that, that film just pulls between these different genres, shall we say, but the core of it is a realist kind of narrative. Everything makes sense through a human, a real human's kind yeah. of Understanding narrative of it, prose. Yeah. It's just beautiful and everything's just beautiful. I mean, that's the thing. This film is fantastic. Yeah, it is there really any, is. Is there any other bits uh, you love? Sorry, uh, I did yeah, interrupt you. Yeah, I, I, I really love the Cheddar Goblin um, advert. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. That, that, that's a kind of comedy escape. Um, which I think and uh, it, it, it's it's not my favourite, but it's definitely memorable. Is um, when when he when he's tied up, one of the uh, the demons is is watching porno, and he gets pretty excited. <laughs> As you see this this horned claw get erected. Oh, it's just, it's bizarre. <laughs> the whole thing's bizarre. Um, uh, one of my other favourite scenes as well, though, is uh, the LSD trip between, between Sand and Mandy, where he's talking, but their faces merge, and, and then they merge back again, and then they merge together again, and then they merge back. And you're watching the screen, and you're just like, what's happening? What's wrong with your face? Like, how are you talking without your lips? It's just a really nice editing where it's seamless, where, like, the hairline and the face and yes. the shadows, it just really works. And you're just staring at these actors. Uh, that that was great. There's really so much cinematography that. that is magnificent in this. Yes, the yeah, soundtrack yeah. soundtrack overlaying it, it's just beautiful kind of artistry like i said the lack of conversation between the chemist and uh red in, in that sequence where there's a one uh, somehow he's psychically reading red or just reading yeah. his body language and he's just clicking as if all the information's revealing itself to him right. without words and again that's totally different to any other scene in the film and it's just like really cool ideas for sequences just roll out through that film yeah and yeah the, the, oh, it's just so good uh, and I think my other most memorable sequence, because it was the one that, you know, the, the, the one that stung the most is when he's got, when he's just staring at the ashes of Mandy and when it just blows away in the wind like that. Oh, that, that hurts watching that moment. Oh, brutal. I mean, the really. way they've set up, I mean, as we said, the pacing of the first half film is gentle and slow and and kind almost. Yeah. And to that point, so, I mean, that jarring moment just prior to it shakes you and you, and then you're uncertain and then. Yeah. She's gone, and and it is just 
ruinous. It really is, yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. again, like I said, the contrast then between that and the uncaring, kind of real world, like, carrying on as if nothing had happened. Uh, that stark contrast, it's, yeah, it gets me, it gets me. Hmm. Well, Jess, do you recommend Mandy? Absolutely. It's it's a fantastic film. We'll, we'll carry on that maybe with some of the chalk and cheese of nature. I, I don't, honestly, you should watch it no matter what you feel in the cage. It's, it is... It's a well-received film. Everyone should go out. If you enjoy it, please, again, support these films by getting a DVD, Blu-ray, or limited edition VHS. I've just <laughs> spotted before we started this. There's apparently a limited run VHS of Mandy coming out this year, or has come out this year, and that looks fantastic as well. Again, it's a film of the 80s. It's style, it's shooting style. If you enjoy those films, it's got gentle nods throughout to various other genres, Um within the 80s but crystal lake and horror of the 80s is definitely bleeding through but it's just beautifully made if you enjoy filmmaking at its highest caliber this is not just an indie film it, it, it kind of transcends being that it's a high budget high intensity revenge horror drama oh, yeah. fantasy it, it's everything you could possibly want it's just fantastic yeah yeah, I definitely recommend Mandy. But this is not a standard revenge thriller that anyone really can enjoy. It's hyper-stylized, very art house, with elements of grindhouse, with a mixture of David Lynch and Rob Zombie for good measure. Visually, this nightmare is outstanding to look at. It's stunning and beautiful, dreamy and, and striking. The cinematography is outstanding. The music by Johan Johansson was suitably trippy and strange and very notable. I also loved the performances from all the cast. The vile, disgusting cult, the Cenobite monsters and Nick Cage were all fantastic. The only major criticism of the film would maybe be the pace. As the first hour contains little dialogue, it's a slow burn compared to the insane depths the film reaches. The film has a beautiful hypnotic effect that just doesn't let you go. And when it ends, you'll be asking yourself, what did I just watch? And then you'll need a timeout to kind of readjust back to reality after. This film is cinema and it's a treasure. It's so refreshing and highly entertaining. And I know a lot of folks won't enjoy it. It will be a divisive film, but I feel that it's astonishing and truly memorable. Definitely check out Mandy. <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. It's all but a beautiful dream.